Greetings, friends and colleagues. It really gives me a great pleasure to have the opportunity to address the HPTN, and I want to thank the organizers for asking me to give this presentation. Shown on this first slide, I decided to discuss with you today the public health and scientific challenges associated with the historic pandemic that we are experiencing now of COVID-19. This slide is a shot of a viewpoint that I recently, a few months ago actually, in January of this year, wrote for JAMA. And as you can see from the title, I've decided to call it coronavirus infections more than just the common cold. I was not trying to be facetious. What I was trying to do was to point out to the readers the fact that we have had experience with coronavirus now for many, many decades. In fact, if you look at this phylogenetic tree and you see the human coronaviruses highlighted in red, you know that this virus is also endemic in bats. And in fact, bats may be the primary reservoir of this infection. But four of these coronaviruses that are highlighted in yellow are the common cold coronaviruses. In other words, about 15 to 30% of all the recurrent common colds that we repetitively get each year during the winter months, usually, are caused by these or one or more of these four coronaviruses. And then as the years went by in 2002, we were first uh, met with the first pandemic coronavirus, the SARS coronavirus that emerged from China, from a bat to a civet cat to a human, leading to an outbreak of 8,000 individuals with about 800 deaths. And then there was the MERS outbreak in 2012, again from a bat to a camel to a human, that led to an outbreak that continues at a low level to smolder. Fast forward from 2012 now to 2020, we have the emergence of yet again the third pandemic coronavirus, again emerging out of China in the Wuhan district in central China, first recognized at the end of 2019. The Chinese identified this, put the sequence on a public database, and now we're dealing with the third pandemic coronavirus. As shown here on this phylogenetic tree, it has been called SARS coronavirus 2 because of its phylogenetic proximity to the original SARS coronavirus 1. And so just to be clear, the disease is called COVID-19 or coronavirus disease 2019 because of the emergence in December of 2019, at least to our knowledge, December 2019. And the virus itself, as I mentioned a moment ago, is called SARS coronavirus 2. So what are we dealing with? We're dealing with a pandemic of historic proportions, the likes of which nothing we have seen for 102 years since 1918. Right now, as of a couple of days ago, there have been 35 million cases worldwide and over a million deaths. Unfortunately for the United States, we have been the worst hit country in the world with almost 7.5 million cases and about 208,000 deaths. By the time you hear this talk, it will likely be closer to 210,000 deaths. The heat map of the United States shows the relative density of cases per 100,000 population. I want to take a minute to talk a little bit about the difference in response, uh, in, in, in burden, as it were, and response between the United States and Europe. As shown on this slide, the European Union had their peak a little bit before that in the United States. But when they finally turned the corner and came down and locked down, as it were, their baseline number of cases per day was very low, well below 10,000 per day. They're starting to creep up now as they try to reopen their economy and kids come back to school and the weather gets cooler. As you can see, they've inched up now to almost 39,000 per day. The United States, however, was a little different. We peaked predominantly driven by the northeastern part of the country as manifested by the dominating outbreak in the New York metropolitan area, which at one point accounted for about 40% of all the country's infections, hospitalizations, and deaths. 
But as New York brought their cases down to a low baseline, the rest of the country started to surge. And in fact, our baseline never got below 20,000 per day. And in fact, when we had the surge in the South that you recall dominated by Florida, Texas, Arizona, Georgia, and Southern California, we surged up to 70,000 cases per day, came down a little where we're now stuck at 40 to 45,000 cases a day. That's an unacceptable baseline that we can't really get into the fall at that high a level. Why did that happen? Well, if you look at a comparison between the United States and Italy and Spain, which are reflective of the entire European Union, you can measure the extent to which you actually shut down by looking at mobility over time in things like visits to parks and outdoor spaces. As shown on this slide, we did not go down as much as Italy or Spain. The same with regard to workplaces, the United States and the dark line did not go as steeply down as did Italy and Spain. And finally, things like trips to the grocery or pharmacy store, a significant difference between the United States and representative European Union countries. Let me jump now to the virology very quickly. I'm sure the audience is pretty familiar with this. It's a beta coronavirus, an RNA virus with a large genome of 30,000 KB, uh, 30,000 uh, base pairs, four structural proteins. The spike protein is the protein that is the one that has been most well studied because of the receptor binding domain on that spike, which binds to the ACE2 receptor, which is distributed widely throughout the body, particularly in the upper and lower respiratory tract, as well as the GI tract. Moving on to transmission, we all know it's a respiratory virus transmitted between people in close contact by both the typical respiratory droplets, as well as now increased incidence that a degree of aerosol transmission does take place. The virus is found in a number of body fluids, but their role in transmission is unclear both domesticated and zoo animals can get infected again, that is not felt to be a source of human infection. The risk of transmission increases with the duration of exposure and the type of exposure, reason why we talk about keeping distance. Secondary spreader infections generally occur in households as well as in congregate settings in closed spaces such as cruise ships, nursing homes, meatpacking plants. There have been a number of clustered in social gatherings, such as in choirs and in churches. This slide from the CDC speaks about the relative risks, the odds ratio of getting infected if you are in one or more of these places. And notice the data with regard to restaurants, gyms, bars and coffee shops, as well as certain church and religious gatherings. Another aspect of this infection that is unique and very troublesome when one thinks about control is the fact that about 40 to 45% of all the infections are actually asymptomatic. Superimposed upon this is the fact that the infections themselves that spread, modeling studies show that a substantial proportion of transmissions occur from an asymptomatic person to an individual who's uninfected. So what are some of the fundamentals for the prevention of acquisition and transmission? They're shown here, and I speak about this continually over and over again, the universal wearing of masks and cloth coverings, maintaining physical distance, the six foot rule, avoiding crowds in congregate settings, always realizing that outdoor functions are always better than indoor functions, including outdoor dining in restaurants, and then finally, frequent washing of hands. The clinical manifestations, particularly early on, resemble very closely a flu-like syndrome as shown on this slide. An interesting peculiarity of this is that in some patients, there's an interesting loss of smell and taste, which generally precedes the onset of the respiratory symptoms. As I mentioned, in addition to the 40 to 45% of people who have no symptoms, 
when one does have symptoms, most of them, about 80%, are mild to moderate, not requiring intervention medically, whereas about 15 to 20% of them are either severe or critical with a case fatality rate that varies from a few percent to up to 20 to 25% of individuals who require mechanical ventilation. The manifestations of severe disease are predominantly the acute respiratory syndrome, but as we learn more and more about this extraordinary disease, we find that some patients, in fact, a reasonable percentage of patients have other organ system involvement with cardiac injuries manifested by arrhythmias and cardiomyopathies, acute kidney injuries, neurological disorders, an interesting hypercoagulable state with microthrombi and embolism, thromboembolic phenomenon leading to acute strokes, and also a very interesting multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children with now over 800 cases reported worldwide. The people who are at increased risk for severe COVID illness are adults. And when one looks at the data, you see the extraordinary progression of rate of hospitalization per 100,000 population as one gets older and older in the age bracket with very few hospitalizations in children and very young adults and adolescents to the high level as seen in individuals 75 years of age or older. In addition, people of any age with certain underlying medical conditions are at an increased risk for severe disease. Some of these that are strongly associated with an increased risk are shown on this slide. I point out specifically things that are of high association, such as obesity, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, serious heart disease, but essentially everything you see on this slide. There are other conditions with less of a clear-cut association that may confer increased risk. They're shown on this slide. I might point out one or two of them that appear to have a, of a, of a greater degree of risk than others, and that is hypertension, chronic lung disease, and diabetes. I also want to point out the issue of immunocompromised state, including HIV individuals. And there's a lot of discussion about that, but we're learning more and more about the relative risk in HIV infected individuals. And to make quite a long story somewhat shorter, it's the HIV comorbidities that are the potential risk factors for COVID-19, especially in older individuals. And in fact, there have been a few studies, here's one by Carlos Del Rio, in which they looked at a number of studies in Europe and the United States, and the major method, excuse me, the major message of this is that comorbidities is the major driver of severe COVID-19 in persons with and without HIV co-infection. So HIV alone does not give you a higher risk. It's the comorbidities, particularly things like uh, increased manifestations of aging that we know so well in HIV-infected individuals and some of the other comorbidities they have. Here's another study of an analysis of greater than 50,000 people with COVID-19, including over 400 people who have both HIV and SARS. And again, higher morbidity is seen in people with HIV, and that's driven by the higher uh, burden of comorbidities. Moving on to another disturbing part about all of this, is the racial and ethnic disparities, namely African-American, Latinx, and uh, Native Americans, Alaska Natives, and Pacific Islanders who have an increased incidence of getting infected in the first place and because of their comorbidities, an increased incidence of serious consequences of infection. And again, using the parameter of the rate of hospitalizations per 100,000 population, just take a look at the dramatic difference between Hispanic, Latinx, Black, non-Hispanics, and whites with 360 plus in the Hispanics and the Blacks and only 80 in the white, a major, major difference. With regard to therapeutics, the NIH has put together a treatment guidelines panel, which is actually a group that is producing a living document accessible online 
at the link shown on this slide, COVID-19 treatmentguidelines.nih.gov, which is updated in real time as new data become available to assist clinicians throughout the country and the world in the treatment of patients with COVID-19. This is a list of some of the therapeutics. I will get to the remdesivir and dexamethasone in a moment, but first let's look at some of the investigational therapies that are being pursued. There are direct antivirals, blood-derived products such as convalescent plasma, which has an EUA, but which we're still trying to determine if it really does work in the sense is really effective. We believe it's safe. Clinical trials will show that shortly. There's monoclonal antibodies, there's immune modulators such as cytokine inhibitors, as well as adjunct therapies such as anticoagulants. I wanna make just a brief comment about monoclonal antibody studies, because this is an area that people are getting very excited about, is being tested in the outpatient basis as inpatient doing family prophylaxis studies, whereas one member of the family is infected and you prophylact the rest of the family to see if you could prevent intra-family spread. And then there's the primary prophylaxis in nursing homes. Now let's get back to the remdesivir and the dexamethasone. These are two that have been shown by randomized placebo-controlled trials to work. What do we mean? First, remdesivir was the first of the randomized placebo-controlled trials that were used in over 1,000 individuals in 10 countries in the United States, Europe, and Asia. The result was that in hospitalized patients requiring lower dose oxygen, there was a significant diminution in the time to uh, recovery or essentially leaving the hospital. A UK study in over 6,000 patients, again, another randomized placebo-controlled trial of individuals with advanced disease, hospitalized, on ventilators, or receiving oxygens, the study showed a significant diminution in 28-day mortality. Of note, the dexamethasone was not only not effective in earlier patients, but actually could be harmful, which really goes along with our knowledge of the pathogenesis of this disease, where you want to attack the virus early on and leave the immune system intact, whereas later on, you want to blunt the aberrant inflammatory and immunological responses. Let me close with a brief discussion of vaccines. We have taken a strategic approach to COVID-19 vaccine research and development as shown on this commentary that my colleagues and I wrote in science a few months ago. By strategic approach, we mean we want to harmonize the approach by getting a, a, a harmonized protocol using a common DSMB aiming at common primary and secondary endpoints and using common immunological parameters for correlates of immunity. This is a list of the three platforms that are being pursued, nucleic acid with mRNA, viral vectors, including ChimpAD, HumanAD, and VSV, as well as protein subunits with and without adjuvants. As shown on the right-hand part of the slide, five out of the six of these are already in phase three trials. Two went early on in July, July 27th, the Moderna and the Pfizer trial went on. We expect that by November or December, we will have results that will tell us whether we have a safe and effective vaccine. Obviously, as all of you know, there's no guarantee, but we have cautious optimism given what we've seen in animal studies and in the early phase one trials, which indicated rather robust neutralizing antibody response. We feel cautiously optimistic that we will have a vaccine in November or December that we can begin to distribute according to the prioritization that has been suggested by the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices and the National Academy of Medicine. This is a map showing some of the sites for the NIID COVID-19 Prevention Network. As seen here, many of these sites you're very familiar with because they really incorporated the clinical network sites that we've used for HPTN, HVTN, and ACTG. These will be well used now as we take things that we've been successful in the past and apply them to the rather substantial challenge 
we're facing with COVID-19. I'd like to stop there and thank again the organizers for giving me the opportunity to make this presentation.